Let's talk about one of the most popular, one of the most popular words in our industry in, I want to say 15 years. Um, and if you're relatively new to the industry or came in in the past 15 years, it's the number one word you've probably ever heard, depending upon what you're talking about, of course. But let's see, hopefully you can, hopefully you can see this stuff when I write on the board. Integration, can you see that okay? Um, what does integration mean? I mean, we all know it's like, oh yeah, it's like uh, complex exercise. It's your whole body movement. It's, um, it's functional stuff. It's like, well, back off because I'm not sure that we really know the definition of any of those things we just said. Why am I being picky about the definition? Because it matters. What are we really talking about here? This is really interesting to me. Let me read this to you. Um, integration. A definition. Integration is the act of bringing together smaller components into a single system that functions as one, that operates, that's a great synonym for functions, a single system that operates as one. And there's an, there's an uh, IT context and there's a mathematical context, but this definition pretty much applies to what we're trying to do with the body relative to something like exercise. What is it that we're integrating? Components. What are those components? Well, without going too much deeper, it's your individual joints. When you're doing a gross movement, an all-encompassing movement, like you've heard of gross anatomy, looking at it in an all-encompassing manner, guys, integrated movement is built upon each individual joint's movement the sequence of those movements, and some of them may not be moving at all, or they may be moving very specific timing and very specific ranges. Not all the same range, not all the same timing, not all the same amount of required torque muscular output from those muscles around those specific joints. So what am I saying? This integrated movement is made of a whole bunch of pieces and your brain is putting together an integrated movement, like a jigsaw puzzle. Motor learning experts talk about your brain orchestrating a solution. The organization of muscular contraction to this ultimate motor recruitment solution to solve this puzzle, this is not, not a problem, not a solution to a problem, a solution to a puzzle, called running. Called not just running, but this step, this swing phase, this push, Anything you do has got to every hundredth hour or thousandth of a second a new solution based upon the current physics-based problem. Puzzle. If you're missing pieces to that puzzle, then your brain has to come up with plan B. If you fatigue something, plan B. Maybe plan C, maybe plan D. My point is, that's where we start leading to this thing that we like to call compensation, which is not a bad thing. It's how we keep moving when some parts aren't working. The problem is, we think integration is everything. I've heard people say that you don't need to worry about specific joints and muscles because it's integrated. That's like saying, don't worry about this puzzle piece. It's going to make a picture with a missing piece, right? If you're not seeing this, if you're not, if you haven't heard people talk, experts talking about integration, 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 you've got to train the way you're going to be doing stuff, awesome, unless you don't have the pieces. And the thing we know from motor learning, I was talking to this guy who's a professor and also does a lot of research and also has done a lot of rehab and has also done a lot of training in the MBA. And one of the things through his vast experience was this that he said, when I said, what really is motor learning? Motor learning is this orchestration, this putting together of, in essence, a skill. The learning curve of putting together a skill and the things required. What he called morphological substrates. What's that mean? It's the pieces, the components you have to have. These are the things that must be in place in order to do this skill. A certain amount of output from the muscles. Yes, a certain amount of what the world calls strength. Morphological constraints. I mean, what are the things in the way? of achieving that thing. The body has to work around or, or become limitations to creating that skill. 
These are the pieces, these are the components, and the outcome is 100% based upon the components you have, the components you don't have, and your skill of putting those things together. This is why balancing is not the best way to get good at balancing. Because if you have missing sensation in the bottom of your foot because you're a diabetic, if you have missing toe flexors, or you have them but they're not strong enough to do the job, or any of the other numerous foot and ankle muscles, balancing is really tough. And what you're really trying to do when you try to balance and try to work on balancing, is you're learning to balance via compensation. You're learning to find a way around the stuff you don't have. The world likes to think that this is the best way to improve the weak links. There's no evidence of that. In fact, all evidence to the contrary. All evidence to the contrary. So here's a way to think about it. Complex movements. The, the world calls integrated. Right? I like to also think of them as having a level, a level of, of skill. That's part of the complexity of it. And so this skill thing creates a learning curve. And there's, there's all degrees. There's a continuum of skill. Really, relatively basic movements, single joint movements in order to control them are a level of skill. Because the skill is, can you hold all the other stuff still while you're doing this? People go, this is isolated. It's isolated movement and it's total body activity. Why is it that people can do a plank and move nothing and call it total body? And if I move one thing, it's now isolated. It's still total body, okay? <laughs> you have trouble separating the flashy movement stuff from the stuff that's working hard to keep from moving. Well, that's not functional. What if it improves the operational status, i.e. functional capabilities of specific things in you? That's a consideration we've got to take care of and take a look at. You've got complex movements. And the question is, what if you have what the world calls weak links? And I really kind of hate that term. They could be missing for lots of reasons. You could have missing, you could have uh, osteophytes in your joint that uh, you miss joint positions. They don't, they're not available to you anymore. I can't do much about that without some kind of surgery, right? And I'm not a surgeon today. Weak links, what I prefer to think of as, um, Maybe missing components. And what I really hope that the only thing is missing is um, strength. Or better said, because to me strength is a very different thing. Strength is skill oriented by the way we test it. I prefer to think of it as the word output. Outputs, the, in my mind, the tension producing capabilities of the tissues. And I don't mean a muscle. I mean all of the tissues on the given side of a joint. Because that's really what you're using and what's happening is when you apply resistance one direction, it's on one side of the axis around a joint, all those guys are going to be called into play in varying degrees to deal with that resistance in sort of an internal tug of war. So how much tension producing capability do you have? Do you have enough to accomplish the goal? Do you have some areas that are truly missing the appropriate output required? You may actually have some inhibited regions of muscle based on the neuromuscular divisions. All of these are things that we might be able to deal with. Now what I hear very commonly, and here's another word I have a lot of trouble with, corrective exercise, not a word, but a term. You see, there's a lot of people out there, oh, I'm an expert in corrective exercise. You got a God complex? You think you're God? You're not fixing things, you're not correcting things. The body, the body is, too complex for you to think you know enough about it to correct it. It's very rarely making mistakes. When something's not working, it's usually purposeful. It's an appropriate response to stress. It's a protective maneuver inside of there, a protective mechanism. There's all kinds of things that we stop thinking the body's doing wrong. Oh, I've got all this tension in my hamstring. Is that wrong or is that a response to something that's appropriate? Fix the something, because that's just a symptom maybe. Corrective exercise, you're not correcting anything. The only thing we might be able to correct Maybe a couple things. Number one, you might be able to change from something with less output to more. That's what the world calls strengthening. That's not a correction. That's an optimization. And once the body's optimized, there's a lot of times when it will take you up on that. In that orchestration process we were talking about, if you bring something back and make it available, that puzzle piece is now available, very many times this thing up here will orchestrate it back into play. It will reduce the compensatory situation because that, that player, that piece is back, that component returns to viability. 
So I, I think this corrective exercise thing, I mean, it's, it's a false empowerment deal. It, it really is. And, and there's another idea with corrective exercise in that it's entirely possible also that the person's just got really bad habits. And the corrective exercise is more of a retraining, not unlike training a dog to, look, you've got the ability to stand up straighter. Now you have to choose to. There's no strengthening I can do to make you stand up straighter. That's like saying, I could strengthen your shoulder muscles enough that your arm would walk around like this all the time. Seriously, to think that I'm gonna strengthen these muscles back here and it's gonna constantly pull me into this position without, without me choosing to is crazy. No place else in your body can you strengthen something so much that it involuntarily just stays out there. It's crazy. So I would like for you to think of dealing with, yeah, maybe the weak links, more, more accurately the missing components, which really probably have to do with the main thing we can affect, which is output. Now here's an interesting thing. In order to do that, what's that gonna look like? Well, again, I like the word, term, focused challenge. Because what I'm really trying to do is identify what's missing, identify this missing component, focus an appropriate challenge on that piece, that region, that, now you know what the world calls it, the world calls it isolation. And that's really interesting because if you're from the bodybuilding community, you really want to isolate this. Okay, are you doing it? Because you got 15 joints moving there because you're trying to move a lot of weight. Why don't you move the weight that that area can move? Just an idea. And it's probably a harder exercise. The, the, the integration world wants to say isolation's bad for you. The biggest thing that's funny to me is the integration world doesn't even know what they're talking about when they're trying to refer to isolation. They have multiple contexts. One time they're saying, well, you isolate a muscle, you're training it differently, and it'll never work with the other muscles right. Okay, you can never isolate a muscle in an exercise. You can't switch off the surrounding muscles. Your brain is responding to a resistance, a direction of force that's opposing you. Everything on the certain side of an axis is gonna to attempt to work in varying degrees. So the most isolated you could do is to focus the challenge on a specific aspect, orientation to the joint, to get what you want from a set of muscles, a region of muscles based on their attachment, direction of resistance, and the axis created therein. These are the mechanical realities of isolation. So am I talking about isolating a muscle? Never, never. Am I talking about isolating the challenge to somebody, to a thing, to a piece, to a component that kind of needs to be tutored. See, that's really what we're doing. That's really what we're doing here. You've got a class of 30 kids and one poor little kid's having trouble with this. At the current rate, at the current volume of information being thrown out, the current difficulty of the information being thrown out, the current speed at, within, at which the information is being delivered, and maybe even the process of delivery. Maybe they're a kinetic learner versus an audio learner. You know what I'm talking about. The kid's struggling, okay? Maybe his preparation for this, maybe he wasn't progressed well to get to this grade based on his former school or his former teacher. These are realities, and if you can't already see how this relates to exercise, clients, and training, you need to go back and review this again and start thinking a little bit, because this is huge. Now listen to me. That kid, here's what we can do. We can keep him integrated in this class. And we can say, catch up, catch up, catch up, and he's going to get further and further behind. That's what these guys do, folks. Some people say, no, 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 I've done the complex motion and I watched the motion get better. It's called compensation. It's a skill, it's an internal skill. We get better, that's how we survive. We get good at limping. So good it almost doesn't look like a limp anymore. So good that we can almost kind of make it look like a run. Dude, that's not the same thing. And you're just maybe looking at a more, the kid, let's talk about the kid. What do we need to do for that kid? We need to yank him out, either start, if he's not too far behind, let's tutor him at night so that the days don't overwhelm him as much. Overwhelm his, but what if he's really, what if the reason he's behind him is he was sick for six months? He's so far behind that you're not gonna tutor him and keep throwing him back into this class slash exercise. You're gonna have to bail from this class. You're gonna have to tutor him in a way that brings him up to par before he can even dive back in, otherwise he's gonna always be lost. That tutoring is this, it's a focused challenge. And if you bring that challenge or information delivery to where the student currently is. 
to where the compromise currently can do it. Not to where it can't. You can't adapt to what you can't do. So you bring the challenge to what the missing, weaker stuff can do and cultivate it along. And it might actually move faster with smaller bites, more manageable bites for its current level of challenge. The kid, by not doing it the same way, hearing it the same way, same speed, same volume as the rest of the class, might actually move along faster than when he was sitting in the class. And then there might be a point through the things he's learned and developed from and improved from, you can put him back in the class. This is about physical tutoring. It's the same thing. So what are we going to do? Well, I think there's a skill in education to figure out what focus challenges are. I think the world sucks at them. Because the first thing they do is want to move everything. It's not about that. First thing they want to do is grab a weight and think, well, the weight's in your hand, it's moving. It's good. It's not about that. This is a higher level of skill than all this crap over here from the trainer's point of view. This is a just do it world. If stuff's moving, we're happy. They didn't fall down, they didn't rupture anything, we're good today. This is everything's got to be specific. This is everything's got to be calculated. To do this, you got to be a chef. And there's a difference between a chef and a cook and a microwaver. Chefs know ingredients. They manipulate them to get what they want. They get the best ingredients. They understand how to do it and how long to cook it. And more cooking is not better. Burning is not better. Higher temperatures in the oven are better. What does the cook do? Eh, he's got a recipe. He never strays from the recipe much. Doesn't even know what each thing's going to taste and how much. Oh, I need a little more salt. Oh, I need a little... That's, that's a chef. Chefs make recipes. Cooks follow recipes. I think a lot of us are actually microwavers. You just take the shit, pour it in the bowl, and stick it in there. And, I'm a chef? No. You're not even a protocol follower. I don't know what that is in the exercise world, but it shouldn't be in the exercise world. So what do we do here? Well, we, we, we worked on these things, and we kind of tutored them up, and then you know what we have to do? Yeah, did you think I was saying that integration's a bad word? Are you that bad at listening and interpreting that you hear something that strays a little bit from your sound bites and your belief that I just called it evil? You missed the point. This is about continuums. This is about where, you, where the client is, giving them what they need, not what you want or like, what they need, and bringing it all together. Because in the end, I want them to do all the complex stuff they need to do in their life. This is the end goal for everybody. You shouldn't have to think about what's missing in your body when you try to get up and go to the bathroom. When you go to get a drink of water, any of that stuff is, should be a just do it thing. But sometimes you get good at the just do it stuff or the high level skills like, I don't know, kettlebells or pitching or whatever. Those are skills of varying degrees. Sometimes I've got to go over here and do my homework and then start progressively, progressively integrating this. I can't just go balls to the wall over here when I just tutored this guy up, man. I got to strategically progress the integrative process. And it might be with integrating a couple things at a time, and then a couple more. And then why does everything have to be all at once? That's exactly why 90% of the people that I know that try to work out don't. They might be lazy too. They might not have time too. But let me tell you something. We make this exercise world taste so bad that most people don't like it. And those of us, like myself, that are neurotic and can't leave it alone, or addicted to it, or good at it, which we rarely stray from the stuff we're good at, that's the little percentage that stays over here all the time. That's who we cater to. And these people are the bigger demographic. These people are the bigger business. We just have to stop thinking like us and start thinking like them. We have to start worrying about what we like and what we believe and start worrying about what they need and that's what personal training should be all about. It's not about one-on-one. -on -one. It's about customizing. And customization is not, well, we, choose, we mix up the exercises. No, we, we, I didn't do a bench press with this person. I did a, a dumbbell press with you. That's a shuffling of exercises. I'm talking about manipulating the ingredients. I'm talking about progression that it's beyond counting numbers and 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. Progressions of ranges, progressions of intentions, progressions of efforts, progressions of all versions of time, including acceleration and deceleration, and the physics-based reasons for that. That's what takes people who struggle 
and brings them up to par. Exercise should always feel appropriate and should be appropriate. So this is the thing, man. It's kind of like a figure eight. You want to do something big, you did something big. You find a problem with it. Well, you can't actually see what the problem is. You have to have very different, met oh, I know, you have a functional movement screen. And in that, you can see problems. No, you can't. You see compensation. And you don't know where the compensation is coming from. I'm squatting. I'm twisting when I squat. Oh, it's a spinal thing. No, it's a hip thing. You know what? It could be a big toe thing. And the big toe muscles, because they're inhibited, are preventing dorsiflexion. At least the other side's tightening up in a protective response to big toe extensors preventing dorsiflexion. And so you know what I do? I can't dorsiflex the same thing on one side. We need to stretch your gastroc. It has nothing to do with it. It's really poor detection. You think the only plantar flexor is a gastroc? That's it? Because you know the bit, you like the big one. It's the name you know. Give me a break. This body has so many influences inside of it, and we miss most of them. But my point is, you're standing from the outside, you don't know why it's doing what it's doing. You like to pretend you do, and that's that God complex thing again. We have to have ways of actually figuring out what the potential, maybe real, causes are, not just look at the symptoms and treat symptomology. Headaches are not aspirin deficiencies, okay? So look. We have to break it down. We have to find missing components slash weak links. Forget correcting things. The best you're trying to do is improve the function, the operational status of the pieces in hopes that the body takes you up on it and uses those pieces to build the puzzle. How do we do that? Focus challenges. Much harder than this just do it stuff for skilled professionals only. Sorry. Then what do we got to do? Throw them back in there. How? Strategic progression. Strategic progression. You want to run? Maybe we should walk. You want to walk? Maybe we should stand. You want to stand? Maybe you'd be able to, be able to have enough output and control of your joints to stand up. And standing is not the best way to learn to stand or improve standing. You have to already be able to stand to get better standing. You've got to be there to work on the skill of it. Man, I've said it before, but the absolute best way to become a masterful trainer, the absolute best way is to have people who can't do a single thing you ask them to do. Any exercise that you dispense like a pill, they can't do it. And they can't even do your assessment. What we typically do is go, oh, you need to go to rehab. And you say, no, what we need to do is gain insight. We need to learn what we're looking at, what we're looking for. Sorry about the prepositions at the end of that. This is the fun part. This is what truly makes somebody masterful. And look at it from a business point of view, man. If you can affect somebody at this level because of your level of skill, not just your sound bites you memorized and hopes that you can pull it off, do you get skilled at this version of investigation? Forget assessment. Fitness assessments, canned bullshit. Investigating what they really need. Investigating where they are, the edge of can versus can't. Because again, like I said, you can't adapt to what you can't do. So we're always looking for that edge. It's a constant, ongoing investigation. This is what makes it worth it. I can't tell you how many people I've had come through RTS and say, my God, I had just applied to law school. I was getting out of this exercise thing. I was just going back to get my PhD in neuroscience because I didn't see, this was just not, this was not inspiring to me anymore. This was like rote stuff. This was like following protocols. And they see there's much more than that. What the world thinks personal training is, both trainers, managers, and clients, and members, that's not what it is at all. It's a much bigger, cooler thing than that.